All right. Yeah, it looks like a, a church getting stuff done, doesn't it? <laughs> Sounds like it. Yeah. There's an attempt being made. There is. There is a, there is a valiant they attempt. They said they would have it down at by the time they got it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, let's pray, and, and then we're only going to cover the first <clears throat> eight verses of Revelation chapter 21 tonight. So, But let's pray, and then we'll get somebody to read that, and we'll, we'll just dive right in. Father, thank you for this time. Thanks for allowing us to be here in the cool of the basement, Lord. And Father, I do praise you. I thank you for all the work that's being done for Vacation Bible School. And I thank you, Lord, also for the work that's being done to, to help the church, to make it a more uh, comfortable place, Father, for us to worship you and, and not have distractions. And, and Lord, we just praise you for that. Thank you for the guys that are even working now. and Keep them safe while they work. Lord, bless our evening. Thank you for allowing us to progress to chapter 21 in Revelation. Thank you for, for keeping it fresh every time we come to your word. And, and Father, just bless your word. Bless it as it will be read. Bless it as we will talk about it and, and, and hear truth proclaimed. And, and use it in our lives, Father. It's an amazing thing to, to realize how you're using the book of Revelation in our lives personally to increase our faith. And for that, we give you all the glory. So, Father, God, guide the discussions, guide everything that takes place tonight, all for your glory. Thank you for everyone that's here. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Do you have anything you want to sling at us? That seems to be uh, how we start our... Got anything? No, I, after vacation, I'm kind of blank. <laughs> <laughs> what you didn't hear on the message last week was about a 20-minute conversation prior to that, and well, I just started it. You had a big conversation. Oh, yeah, there was more to it, but it was good. Yeah. Did you say swing at us? Or sling. Sling. Like David. Like David. Sling, like David just yeah. Whew, that's... yeah, we had talked about how <clears throat> um, in, I love in that thousand-year reign... Who's reigning over who? What's being reigned over? Who's left after the after everybody's gone? You know, and so you know we had a discussion regarding that. And if anybody has any points of view on that, I'd love to hear. But, <laughs> but you know, uh, there's you know some people have a good strong foundation for that, and some of us are still you know maybe feeling their way around through that. So. And that's, you know, and that's, that's the point of this study. And, and, you know, to be able to dig a little deeper and have, you know, it was more of a conversation just talking about that. Because there are things in, in Revelation that, that we've just talked about. Because, again, and I've said this all the way through, you can go to ten different commentaries and you will get ten different interpretations to, to these things. Um, but, but that, I mean, what it boils down to, and, and, and a lot of the commentaries I use, one is just all Greek. And that's, that's all it is. That's all it bases everything off of. Um, but anybody can study Greek. And the thing about it when we come to study the book of Revelation, as with any, anything in Scripture, is it's the Holy Spirit who teaches. It's not us. It's not a Greek scholar. That'll give you some, some depth and understanding of words that are translated into the English a little bit. But when it comes down to it, it's the Holy Spirit who teaches us. And, and that's the one thing we need to always constantly remember. And I have to remember, too, because I can jump into this and, and be very academic about it and just really dive in. And, and it's like, wait a minute, you know, I can get loaded up with all these things, but, but it's, it's the Holy Spirit that has to teach us. In everything that we study, that's to the books that maybe people look at are, are easier to teach from. And then Revelation is, is probably one of the hardest books to teach from. There's a lot of commentaries or people who have full Bible commentaries who leave Revelation out. It's just, it's, it's a difficult book. But um, I think the Lord is blessed. And I think that it's really cool that you can come with questions because you're pondering this. You're, you're looking at this. You're thinking about it. You're meditating on it. You want um, truth from the scripture. And that's, that's what this is all about. It's not just trying to, to ramrod a, a, a certain view. And, and we've kind of hit on the three major views premillennialism, postmillennialism, and amillennialism. It's not just trying to drive that, but, but how does the scripture direct us in these things? So I, I hope it's been profitable. But again, we're probably uh, one, two, we're probably just three, maybe three or four, um, probably no more than four studies, and then we're, we're finished with this. So that's, that's kind of exciting uh, <laughs> to get through that. Um, but did you have anything that you wanted to... Or you said you were kind of zapped out from vacation. Yeah, yeah no, I, I really hadn't. 
given it much more thought than right. our last one. So. You know, I, w I would like to add to your point on this spirit mm -hmm. that I, ha I was fortunate enough to have two very powerful spiritual experiences. Mm -hmm. in me, one with Jesus Christ and one with God. Mm. And not a single word, was, they were so powerful, but not a single word was said. Mm. And the first one was vision, I actually saw Jesus Christ. But the second one was God, I just felt the power of baptismal in the Black Sea. And yeah, we talked about yes, that. Yes, and what I would like indeed, if it is possible, while we're going through the text and through the, all the intellectual notions, to stay focused on the Spirit. Yeah, absolutely. Because again, you know, you can, you can approach Scripture, you know, there are people who've studied it, people who've, you can be unconverted and, and write commentaries on Scripture. That's, that's not the point. It's, is the Holy Spirit the one who's leading the teaching, giving us insight with the mind of Christ, understanding what's being said, and then applying it. <clears throat> that's the biggest thing, I think, with, with teaching. We can teach stuff, but if you can't apply it, if it's not applicable for your life, then, then really, you know, all Scripture is, is inspired of God. It, it's there to, to move in us and to, and to challenge us and to rebuke us and do all these things. So um, that, that for me is a big part. We're probably, um, anybody here familiar with like the Matthew Henry commentaries? Matthew Henry, he was, he was a Puritan, but his commentaries, when I was in seminary, they, they would not, this is crazy, when we would write papers and stuff, they would not let us use Matthew Henry's commentaries because I think in, in their minds they were more shallow, but they're more about, um, well, how can I put it, uh, they're practical, applicable, um, Devotional. I think that's probably how they looked at it. They were more devotional as opposed to the theology. But, but here's the thing. I mean, there are, there are a lot of people who puff themselves up with theology. But if there's no devotion, if you're not getting anything out of it that you can right. you know, draw closer to the Lord, then you, it's just academics. And, and so I don't, I don't th that's not how we're approaching this. I think we have approached it um, in a very devotional way. You know, one thing that, that reminds me, Matt, when you, when you pray now, how your prayer life has been affected by the book of Revelation. That's a pretty awesome thing. And that inspires me, too, when I pray, how God looks at our prayers and how he rejoices when we pray, how he receives that as a pleasant incense. I mean, that's, that's powerful stuff. I and mean, that's, that's one of the things we've gotten from, from the book of Revelation. All right, well, let's, let's see. Who wants to read? Let's do the first four verses. You read. You're more than welcome. Thank you. <laughs> That's right. Put them to the test. Use them. <laughs> then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. All right. And then 5 through 8, if, if you want to, you can use those glasses. <laughs> <laughs> he, he forgot his Bible, so he had grabbed the two smallest print this Bibles. This is the Good News Translation. <laughs> then the one who sits on the throne said, And now I make all things new. He also said to me, Write this, because these words are true and can be trusted. And he said, It is done. I am the first and the last, the beginning and the end. To anyone who is thirsty, I will give the right to drink from the spring of the waters of life without paying for it. Those who win the victory will receive this from me. I will be their God, and they will be my children. But cowards, traitors, perverts, murderers, the immoral, those who practice magic, those who worship idols, and all liars, the place for them is the lake burning with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. All right. Now if I could have my glasses back. Thank you. <laughs> and of course we do pray the Lord's blessing on his word as we read it. But before we get into this, there's a couple verses of scripture or a couple places in scripture. You can turn there if you want. Second Peter, Second Peter chapter 3, verses 11 through 13. 
what we're into in the book of Revelation with the new heaven and the new earth, these are things that have been prophesied and have been mentioned in other portions of Scripture. And I think it's, it's good just to, just to hit on these and, and recognize the buildup that we're finally here. I mean, it's pretty amazing. Listen to what Peter says. He says, since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So when you think about that, there's something very... um, There's something right there that we can apply to our everyday lives. Look at what he says. That's us. We're waiting for and hastening the coming day of the Lord. You know, that's something that every believer should be longing for. That's something that we should want to see the culmination, not just... Not just for us, not just so that we get to heaven and, and we're out of here and, and all of this, but we've got to remember what, what that means, the coming day of the Lord, when the Lord establishes, first off, when Jesus Christ returns, the bride, he, he brings his bride home, but then when he establishes his throne here on earth, what's taking place? And how things are being placed in the proper order that they were in Eden and, and that sin messed up. So again, remember that trajectory that we're kind of thinking about and, and you know, where, where Eden was and, and where God was, if you want to call it a form of government, that's where a theocracy would have been. It, it technically wasn't a form of government, but God reigned and God walked with his people. Um, sin caused that separation. So now, you know, we've gone up. The pinnacle is the cross. We're coming back down on the other side of that, that mountain, so to speak. And, and all things are being made new. And we're getting back to that point where God will dwell with his people. And so for us as Christians, and and I'm guilty of this. Maybe you guys tell me if you're guilty of this. There are some days that I go through the day and, of course, praying. but, But in my mind, I do not consciously think about the return of Christ. Am I the only one? (laughs) <laughs> good yeah, <we've>, yeah. <laughs> thanks Victor you know I was willing to, to put that out there because when I do that it, 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 for me I, I actively say God I'm sorry I want to be thinking about this I want to think about your return it could be any moment it could be right now you know there's, there's really nothing when the father says to the son go he's coming and, and one of the studies, and I've talked about this, that we're going to get into after this is how the Jewish wedding ties in to eschatology, ties into the end times. And the big thing is that the son, and remember, I go there to prepare a place for you. I will return again. When the father says, son, go get your bride, he doesn't say, right now? You know, he doesn't, there's not this pause. So he goes, and that's why Jesus says, no one knows when the son, or no one knows when, when he'll return, not even the son, that's for the father to know. That's all tied into the Jewish wedding. Um, but again, when the father deems that the son has prepared a place for his people, he's, he's gone, he's coming back, and we're there. So, you know, for us as Christians, waiting for and hastening the coming day, um, because again, things are going to be made new. Things are, we are waiting for new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. I think that's pretty significant because remember, what what was affected by sin? Now, we know our relationship with God, but beyond that, what was affected by sin? Yeah, everything. You know, the, the book of Romans talks about it extensively that, or I think in, in such a beautiful way that all creation is groaning for the redemption. I mean, you think about it and... I don't know if you guys saw on, on Facebook, I posted something yesterday where I'm, we had a rainbow. Did you guys see the rainbow where you... Where you it was a, it, that thing was there for an hour. I've never seen a rainbow there that long, but I'm, but I'm looking at this rainbow, and, and it's beautiful. And it really just caused me to think what a rainbow really is about. You know, not, not anything more than biblically speaking what a rainbow is about. And how God promised he will never, ever flood the earth again in judgment. And, and why did he do that? He did it because of sin. He did it because the whole world was corrupt, except how many people? Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their wives. And that is it. And so I thought about that, and then I thought of the mountain behind you know, what I was looking at, and I recognize, and in, in when you look in the scripture, you know the mountains were raised up and the valleys were dropped down. Probably the topography of the earth was a little different during the flood, but regardless, 
It was a global flood. And I just thought about how angry God was about sin and a righteous anger. And it was funny because Evan and I later, we were sitting there and got the hammock set up, you know, and the rainbow's still there. And I, I had an opportunity to kind of share this with him. And he looked at me and he said, God gets angry. I said, over sin? Yes, God gets angry. But I said, but Jesus on the cross absorbed that for us so that when we're in Jesus and we trust in him, he's not angry anymore. But I was thinking about the depth of water, what it did to the surface of the earth, all the people that perished during that time, and I thought, that is a ferocious anger. And the only thing that can match that is a ferocious love. And, and that, when you look at it, you know, you look at the flood and how catastrophic that is. Now let that kind of go to the other side of the rainbow. God loves us. It's, it, this is not going to make sense, but with a catastrophic yeah, love. Sure. <laughs> you know, it's, the intensity is equal. Um, and, you know, it's a beautiful thing. But again, all creation was affected by sin. It was affected, you know, the animal kingdom changed when sin entered in, obviously from the flood. The, the, and I look at the mountains, and I look, you know, I love mountains. And, and you described it, <clears throat> how we all feel, I think, when we go on vacation. And we hit that West Virginia line, and we see those mountains, and we know we're, we're home. What that does for us. But I often think how beautiful the mountains are, but they are a result of the flood, which is a result of God's wrath over sin. And, you know, he turns he, beauty from ashes. You know, we enjoy these mountains. I, I enjoy them and I praise God when I look at the mountains. And I, but when I step back, I realize, wow, God, you, you, you turn this to beauty. It's, it's a beautiful picture of the cross for me. The cross was horrific. The cross was awful to witness beyond anything. But when we look at it now, do we see it? Do we, you know, shriek away from it? No, we, we, we rejoice in it. It reminds us not of the blood in a grotesque way, but of the blood that was shed in a beautiful way that, that cleansed us of our sins. When I look at a cross, I think of, of beauty. I think of sacrifice. I think of eternal life. Um, but anyway, my point in that is, is all creation, we are waiting. We should be waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. What's the result of the mountains that we see and the peaks being raised and the valleys being low? That is a direct result of God's wrath on sin. So we're looking for all of this to be made new so that we know righteousness dwells. Here's another one. You don't need to turn there, but if you want to mark it, this is Isaiah 65, 17. And again, this goes back, you know, Isaiah, we're talking 700 years before Christ was born. So you can just kind of understand when this prophecy was made, sort of put it into a timeline. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. That's, that, what a fulfillment. We're here. Chapter 21 of Revelation, we are fulfilling Isaiah 65, verse 17. What an awesome culmination. But think about how long that took. I mean, a new, you know, you, the language is so specific that he has to be talking about Revelation 21, verse 1. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. That's, that's one of the things I know with kids, and I think I've shared this before. I, I know Adam, we've talked about it um, at times. Kids love here on earth, and maybe adults do too. And they think, man, going to heaven, what's it going to be like? Because, you know, they're so familiar with things here on earth. But then to describe them, well, there's going to be a rejoining, a new heaven and a new earth, and the new Jerusalem will come down, but all of these things will not be as they are now. They're going to be better. And, and it's funny, when we've talked about that with kids, they've, they've gotten excited about that. Because, you know, heaven to a child sometimes can be a very mysterious thing, and, and kids are a little leery of, of things they, they can't understand or, or you know, the mystery or the mysterical aspect of it. So, oh, <laughs> we're, we're killing you with that. <laughs> but anyway, I wanted us to see how with, with Peter, and here's the interesting thing. You've got the prophets and, and you've got the apostles. And so they're, they're all prophesying and waiting for this culmination that we finally get in Revelation 21. Now, let's jump into it. <clears throat> Revelation 21, he says, I saw... A new heaven and a new earth. 
For the first heaven and the first earth have passed away. Does, does anybody have a different translation other than new? You probably don't. The but first. This is that. New yeah, what's it saying? The first heaven and the first earth. Oh, oh. really? Yeah. <laughs> Then I saw. Oh no, no. Then I saw a new heaven. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> I think we all have new. Next verse. After <clears throat> what is? What do you? Let's let's have a little discussion. What do you? What do you think that means? I mean, new. What do you think of when you think new? I now think it's the correct one. I think the the one that we should have had before. Okay. Should have had. Yeah, we just earned it. Well, okay. are you? What do you? What do you mean by that? That's the one that God created for us. You talking about that was Eden? Marred by sin. Yeah, okay. We mess it up. <laughs> but you're talking about more of putting things back in order. Yes. Okay. What comes to my mind is uh, because we're looking forward to the uh, union between the bride and the groom. Mm-hmm. Uh, we are pleased to realize that it's going to be in a new place, in a new environment, mm-hmm. in a refreshed environment. I think it looks like something like on the file comes to nine. It's, it's new. It's, it's never been used. It's, uh-huh. it's yeah. brand spanking. And, yeah. that's, and I think yes. that's kind of where the, the Greek goes with this. It's not just a, a literal translation of the word new. Mm-hmm. It actually is closer to fresh, mm-hmm. renovated. Updated. I can't see why there's any discussion about it. The old is gone. Exactly. Right. But here's here's where the discussion falls in, Don. It is not ex nihilo. Okay? Where God, when he created the first heavens and the first earth, he created that from nothing. There are some people who, who want to challenge in the fact that this is, you know, because we read it and it, the first and the heaven has passed away. So what does that mean? Does that mean he got rid of all this? Like this is this is gone and then ex nihilo he created something Again, that's not From what. Scratch. Yeah, that's not what the scripture is saying. So that's kind of where the discussion falls in. In that this is this is a renovated. Let me let me read to you one one commentary. It says some scholars, however, believe that the passage here follows the Jewish tradition of a renovated earth. Somebody states that this is not ex nihilo new creation, but a transformed world. The old heaven and the old earth were not destroyed, but departed. Or went away from. So that's kind of the idea. This is this is not in the sense of as things were created. Because remember what happened when when God finished creating everything on the sixth day. What did He do? Rested. Yeah. Back and relax. <laughs> yeah. He rested. Creation was 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 done. So in the sense, He's not recreating. He's renovating. It's it's fresh. It's and you kind of described it with with the wedding, you know, and that whole yes. idea. And and there's so much tied into this because again, that that imagery will get there a little bit farther down as as a bride adorned for for the bridegroom or for the groom. But you know, th- there is a freshness to it. You know, what what's the main color of a wedding? White. 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 Yeah. That that beautiful purity. That that cleanness. All of what these things. Does it make yeah, if it's new not... or if it's refreshed? Right. No. And that's that's the point. We're just breaking down. We're we're parsing this, okay? Because you may find somebody challenging you and say, "Wait a minute, you know, hey, new earth, the old one's gone, it's destroyed," and, and you need to know how to combat that and say, "Wait a minute," because you know, annihilus, these kind of things. Because if somebody here's here's how this can lead into a challenging com- confrontation. So when it says disappeared, that doesn't mean destroyed. It passed away. Yeah. What it means, it's not a new earth in the sense of he blew this one up and then created a new earth. We're talking about, and what I mean by that is the entire sphere of the earth. Do you get, do you get what I'm saying? He's not taking this planet that we're on and crushing it and then creating a new one in its place. He's renovating. It's new because, again, what did Peter say? Peter's talking about that we are waiting on new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So sin is being washed away. Sin is being cleansed. The earth is being cleansed of its sin. But it's, it's not an annihilation. It's not a physical change. It is on the exterior, on the exterior. If, if that makes sense. I'm trying to, trying yeah. What did you say, Don? To recap. 
Yeah, it's a recap. That's a great way of that's a great way of looking at it. Because here's here's where we can get or people can here's how people can take scripture and really veer off. Somebody could actually come and say, Well, wait a minute, this means that that all this is annihilated and God will create it new. And then something like that, when you're talking about hell, somebody can say, Well, in hell, and this is this is kind of there are people who believe that once somebody is in hell, they're eventually annihilated. That's not, that's not hell. It's, it's an eternal judgment. So, again, things can get off the track really quick, and then when they do get off the track, it's just kind of opening a can of worms. And so, again, the idea here, because we're, we're eventually going to be talking about hell when we finish up this in, in verse 8, but to see a new heaven and a new earth is not in the sense of an ex nihilo creation, but the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. What do we? What's that phrase for us in English when we say "passed away"? Yeah, you know. So, in the sense, the wages of sin is what death. Sin affected everything in the heavens. It affected everything on earth. Um, you know, things are 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 deteriorating. Things. You know, and again, I wish Cindy was here. She could talk to us about the second law of thermodynamics, but we won't get into all that. But basically. And, you know, things are, are, are deteriorating. Right. Things are, they're not... They don't go from a, one state to a better state. Yeah, they there, there's, there's this natural progression state. downward. Yeah. But, um, but again, he's going he's gonna to get rid of all that. All the decay, all of the death, all of the things that sin, how it damaged the earth. No more bugs. Oh, thank goodness. The spiders. They'll be here. They just, won't, they just won't torment you. Yeah, we like stick bugs. They're really cool. <laughs> Mosquitoes will be your friend. Yeah, right. Think on spiders. that. They've been crawling all over me. They, they will be your friend, Mary Sue. Oh, you you won't you won't be afraid of them. You'll pick up a snake. You know. I'm not afraid. You're not when afraid. When we when we die, they will do us a favor. They will eat our flesh. Oh, my ashes, so all right. So we dealt with the first part. Now, and the sea was no more. We think that means. Let's have some thoughts on that. There's no more ocean. There's no more, no more fish. It's just, it's just water. <laughs> you can say the same thing no. you said about the first verse. Yeah. What's, we're verse still in the first they, verse. Well, uh, right. But I think that ocean is gone. This says the heaven it becomes and earth this glass. vanished. Okay. This verse says, and then goes on to say, and no longer any uh, existed in the sea. And that means there wasn't any sea. <laughs> what yes. happened to the fish? The yeah. fish. I don't care. <laughs> and and here's here's one way of looking at this. And and I, I struggle with looking at it this way because one of the things that we've talked about in the book of Revelation is there's figurative language and then but we approach it in a literal sense unless it's obviously figurative. Now there are people that approach this and say, wait a minute, see here doesn't mean see. See here what it means is is the mass of people because remember, where did the beast come out of? came out of the sea. Mm-hmm. Now, that's not necessarily because when we're dealing with the beast, we understand that it's more than just a beast and the prostitute is more than just a woman. Um, so sometimes people will interpret this as, wait a minute, this isn't the oceans. This is the sinful group of people and that's no more. Okay, there are times where you have to apply sea in that manner. But, and I go back to, to the first churches that would have received this letter. When they received this letter, without a doubt, they would have been interpreting it in a literal way unless it was obviously figurative. And we've noticed in in the language that we deal with, it doesn't go from literal to figurative to literal. I mean, that's confusing. And in the book of Revelation, I mean, quite frankly, it can be confusing enough. I, you know, there are times we have to just take the scripture at his word. And the sea was no more. I take that as a literal, like Tina said. You thought I was going to twist it up on you, didn't you? I still am waiting. <laughs> no, no. I'm giving you two sides of it, but I, I struggle. I can't look at that as figurative because, again, a new heaven and a new earth, you know, in the sense of they're going to be, as Don said, a cat put on them, you know, that's, there's a freshness to it. Well, I, think it's it? funny when, in thinking about that and in thinking about death, you know, it's as when a, when a kernel of wheat falls into the ground, mm-hmm. what produces isn't the same thing. So that's kind of the analogy I'm getting. Uh-huh. And that's a, what you were talking about. And there was before. a commentary that, that came across that, and I was, it was kind of neat because um, when you think about it, and I thought about um, out of all the seeds I, 
I've planted beans tend to do this the most. That once they sprout up, the, the seed is still kind of connected to the leaf. Um, it's not done away with, but eventually it, it no longer serves a purpose, and then it, it kind of falls off. Maybe it does that with other seeds, but, but the beans I plant, I've always noticed that in there. So that's kind of an interesting way, because there is, I've read a commentary that, that describes it just kind of like that. that we're talking about. It's not been replaced. I mean, it's not that, like you say, that it was, that it was you know, thrown away. It's, just, it's that... That there has now been. That's kind of like the kernel new. falling into the ground, yeah, bringing forth. Right, it's something new that it wasn't before. And, and you think about it too. Remember, um, in the book of Genesis, when you when you look at the creation, you look at the creation order and the things that were taking place. What was God doing? What was his What was his reasoning for 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 doing? Maybe not even the order, but but what what was he What was he creating? A place for us to live a planet for for humans and it's it's really interesting and i don't know how you guys feel about um you know searching for for other life um in the universe anybody have any thoughts on that i do just waste time <laughs> i agree with you well That's ellen musk name. you know ellen musk yeah. right yeah a very Tesla. talented yeah you know businessman entrepreneur from south africa who lives in california now and that's his home and who has X space um, space program, mm-hmm. which is a commercial uh, rocket, <laughs> you know, reu- now reusable rocket. Okay, mm-hmm. so he's like in the forefront of it, and he is stating, you know, yes, we will we will face a time when we have to, you know, find another planet. And, and in the way I understand that, but it also troubles me, as if Earth. Is something disposable, mm. and and you know, and who is it? Is it Stephen Hawking? Is that am I getting? Stephen Hawking. Yeah, he does the same thing. You know, we got a hundred years, yeah. and if within a hundred years, if we don't find another habitable place to um, for to be as humans, we're we're done. Now, obviously, they're not taking a biblical approach. God created this planet for us to live on. He created it. To, to be able to breathe, to be able to survive, to, to have vegetation, all of these things. It's not just um, happenstance. You know, for us to have a biblical worldview, we, we have to take the scripture for, for what it is that God created this for us. He prepared it for us to live here. Now, the reason I brought that up is God is preparing a place for us, for his bride to live with him. And as Peter said, where righteousness dwells, there's no more sin. So we've got to cleanse sort of the effect of, of sin. Just as he did in the Garden of Eden and or as he created in the creation order and, and man is the crowning creation and, and we're placed on this earth to live, everything we need is here. The same thing is being done with, with the renovation of, of the new heaven and the new earth. It, it's, it's where those who are not in that second death, those who are in that book of life, will live for how long? Forever. Forever. Forever and ever and ever and ever. And, and that's the reality of it. So he's preparing that place for us. And he's also preparing it for himself. Look at verse 2. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. What are your, what are your thoughts on that? Anything? Is it literal? No. You don't think it's literal? No, nope. I don't think it's a bride. Okay, okay. I, I'm sorry. I should have I should have rephrased that. Is it a literal city? Maybe yes. that's that's what yeah, I was yeah, that's yeah. what I was going for more than yes. you threw that out there. You, it's a well, literal city. You, the city is described in such uh, startling detail. Yeah, and we'll get yeah we get into that 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 you have to. And it's it's funny. There are people, and I didn't I didn't I didn't bring this, um, but there are people who have kind of. Um, sort of taken the measurements and sort of laid it out on the earth and how big it is. And, and, and here's the, the challenging or even somewhat troubling aspect. We've, we've seen through the book of Revelation, and we touched on it a couple weeks ago, uh, and we remember broad is the way, or is the gate, and broad is the way in which leads to destruction. Narrow. Narrow is the gate, and narrow is the path that leads to eternal life. And what does it say after that? How many find it? Few. 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 
I mean, when you when you think about that, and you think about this 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 city in this New Jerusalem, um, here's the reality. And and I don't know about you guys, but but this it hit me it hit me hard when we were talking about knowing people who right now loved ones are on a path to hell because they have not yet placed their faith in Christ. How did that affect you guys? I mean, it... It, it immediately started for me in my daily prayer time to pray for that individual. Yeah, and, like... And it's more conscious on my mind in the course of the day right. to think about that individual. Absolutely. And that's how it's affected me because what we did, um, we we found a person... Were you... I don't know if you were here... No, but I, I know yeah, we found a we found a specific person that we knew needed to know Christ and started praying for that person specifically. Now, obviously, that that doesn't mean we're only thinking or praying for that one person, but um, you know, there's a lot more people that won't be in the New Jerusalem than who will be in the Lake of Fire, and and that should should in us give us an urgency. Um, you know, a lot of people, when they, when they come to the point of witnessing or wanting to share their faith, they, they stop in their tracks because they're afraid of screwing it up. What are you going to screw up? I mean, here's the reality. If you're sharing your faith, if you're sharing the gospel with somebody who is right now on a track to hell, what are you going to screw up? <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, and, and I think that, that a lot of times that's how the enemy whispers in our ear. Hey, if you screw this up, you're sending them to hell. No, you're not. I mean, that's the reality right now. Um, they have, wherever they are and not receiving Christ, they're condemned already. That's, that's what is, John speaks about in, in, in the Gospel of John. Uh, you know, they're condemned already, so, so we can't let that be an excuse. Oh, I'm afraid of screwing this up. I think we should be more afraid of not saying anything. We should be more afraid of, of seeing someone right there. The conversation is there. You know, it's right there open for us. Um, it's not like we just walked up to somebody and, and said, hey, you going to heaven or hell? You know, maybe there's a place for that. Maybe there's, there's people that can do that. I'm not one. But when I get to know somebody and we engage in those spiritual conversations, um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be one to just back off of that. You know, if, if God's opened the door, then let's, let's go through it and pray the apostles' prayer. Grant us boldness to speak as we ought. Um, this, to me, generates that, that urgency that we need to remember that, um, new, the new Jerusalem coming down. Now, I sidetracked a little bit, but um, so John in his vision sees Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. She's looking good. <laughs> she's, she's, she's looking good. Do you remember Do you remember what your bride looked like, Don? Roy, do you remember? <laughs> yep. Victor, do you remember what Melissa looked like? Yes, and I have pictures. <laughs> <laughs> I have a picture on, on our bedroom wall of Sarah in her, in her dress. Now, here's a, I don't watch these shows. I came home one night and it was on. I just wanted to gag. Say yes to the dress. You guys familiar with that show? No. <laughs> Good. Good for you. It's a crazy TLC show to where they build up, where these bridezillas, I think as they call them these days, are trying to pick out a dress. And they've got all this family here, and it's just, it's just garbage. It's, it's pre-scripted stuff, but it's reality. And it's all about how much they're paying for a dress. It's got to be perfect, this and that. And it just gets disgusting. You said your sister watches that? Anyway, I realized something. What should be the significance of a bride's dress? Who's she dressing for? Okay, let's take it back. On this show, whether you've seen it or not, who's she dressing for? Herself. Herself, her, her peers, the people that have gathered. Probably the groom's not, any, you know, the big thing, oh, you can't let her see the dress and stuff like that. But when you look at what the New Jerusalem and how it's describing, I think, a great picture of the wedding ceremony, how should or what should a bride's appearance, what should her major... Um, thought process be concerning how she's dressed on her wedding day. Who's that for? It's all for her husband. Yeah, it's all for her husband. And again, we've kind of... It should be pure. Yeah, yeah yes, it should be... spiritual and as spiritual. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I, I think totally. You know, now, you know, white is just, it's the color and, you know, get into all that. But, but you see this 
as the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Now, when I was married, you know, we were, we were in a church, obviously we're on the altar, but I was standing down below. And the way the church was set up, everything kind of went down, you know, sort of on a, on, a, on a slant. It was a bigger church, but everything sort of went down toward the front row. And so if you're standing there and everybody stands up, and my wife's, you know, she's, she's kind of short. So I'm standing there next to my dad, and obviously, you know, everybody stands up. The doors swing open, and I can't see my wife. And I'm, I'm about to have a heart attack. You know, I'm about to faint. It's because the anticipation of, of seeing my bride. And, and seeing her adorned in this beautiful dress coming to me, to marry me. And finally, when I did see her, it was like, I need air. You know, where's, where, where's my air to, to be able to breathe? And now think on this, how I felt, how you felt. God prepared, or new, the new Jerusalem is coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. How should we be longing for this? You know, to, to have that, that excitement for these things to be made new, to see this the city coming down, this prophesied city, the city of God. But there's more to it. You know, look at what is going to take place in this city. God's prepared her. Prepared the city as a bride adorned for her husband. So there's an anticipation aspect on our behalf. But then, verse three, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, "Now, do you? I have read. I have a red letter Bible. Does anybody else here have a red letter Bible where the words of Jesus are, are actually in red? It's all black here. Yeah, it's all black here. So what is that? And again, that's not inspired. But whenever we heard a voice from the throne, who was that? Father. Yeah, when we go back to, to Revelation, what, chapter 2, chapter 3, we're talking about the Father speaking. We're not talking about um, Jesus, and I think that, that with the red letter, they're, they're right on. I heard a voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they, where am I? And they will be his people. This has been being prepared for. All throughout the Old Testament, um, a couple places uh, we can turn. Let's see, Le- Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 27. If you want to turn there, you can, <laughs> or you can just listen, and then there's another place I want to start. Uh, Ezekiel 37, 27. 37, 27. If somebody wants to read that, you can go ahead and... Ezekiel 37, 27. This is the tabernacle. Don't build the stone. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Yea, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So right there, you know, that's that's in Ezekiel. So that's before Christ. And so we'll, we'll get into the fulfillment of this, but we see how prophetic that idea was for God to be dwelling with his people. Uh, let me see I'm going to read another one. Let me find it. Yeah, Leviticus 26.11. It says, I will make my dwelling among you, and my soul shall not abhor you. So, that was Leviticus 26. Shall not abhor you. So, I will make my dwelling among you. Now, we're going way back in Leviticus. And so you're dealing with that. Um, Isaiah 65, 17. You may be able to find that one. I'm already there. I'll just go ahead and read it. Isaiah 65, 17. Actually. For behold, I create a new heaven, new heavens, and a new earth. And the former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. Actually, that should have been with verse 1. Thanks, Tina, for, <laughs> for reading that. Yes, no, you're right, you're right. I should have had that marked up to verse 1. John chapter 1. Let's go to John chapter 1 and deal with what we're talking about here. Because we've dealt with in Ezekiel or Leviticus and Ezekiel, we're seeing this prophetic aspect of God dwelling with his people. Here's a question. What was one of the names that was prophesied about Jesus before he came? What was he going to be called? We sing it a lot at Christmas. Emmanuel. Emmanuel. How many people 
that you know of in the, in the scriptures, in, in the gospels, ever went up to Jesus and said, hey, Emmanuel, how's it going? <laughs> nobody, nobody ever said that. So, number one, that was a fulfillment of that aspect when Jesus Christ, when, when the Word became flesh. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and in the beginning, He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. Then you jump down to, to verse 11. No, verse 10. The true, or verse 9. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. And then verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So the idea of Emmanuel is fulfilled in a sense with Jesus. I mean, that's, that's how it is, but in a partial sense. Because how long did Jesus dwell among his people 33 years now God is talking about something much more permanent here where Jesus fulfills Emmanuel nobody was calling him that but the idea of God being with his people this is something that the Jewish people knowing their scriptures should have recognized in Jesus and, and they missed it you know what are the Jewish people still doing at the Passover who are they waiting for they go to the door and they open it up. They're yeah. waiting for someone specific. They're waiting for a certain prophet. Elijah. 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 He doesn't come. Because why are they waiting on Elijah? Who comes after Elijah? The, the Messiah. Yeah, the Messiah comes after. So they're still waiting on Elijah. This idea, they're still waiting, I don't know to the extent of it, but, but for that Emmanuel. They're waiting on the anointed one to come. And the idea is that God himself became flesh, he is the anointed one, he is the Christ, he, he became a man, he was named Jesus, but he was the Messiah, the anointed one, that's where the Christ falls into that. So for 33 years God dwelt among his people. The Jewish people should have been, they should have taken all that prophecy and, and, and saw it land squarely upon Jesus. But here we're seeing something of permanence. This isn't just a 33-year tabernacle. or that's, that's kind of the literal idea of Jesus Christ. He tabernacled among his people. This is more permanent. Where God is saying, And I heard, or behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. What other time was this absolutely true? Now, God is with us, so you understand what I'm saying. But what other time in history was this absolutely true? Yeah. So again, we're, we're getting things, he's making all things new, but what sin screwed up is being made new. It's being undone. And you think about it, here's a good point, I didn't, I didn't have this thought until now. Um, when we come to faith in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says what? Whoever is in Christ is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come, or the old has passed away. Does that mean, and, and I'm kind of building on something, it just popped in my head, I don't want to just, just um, leave it there. Does that mean that when I came to faith in Christ, who I was as a person, personality, all that, just gone? So you can kind of see how, and again, we're backtracking, but you can kind of see how, what was I, I was created new. I was a new creation. There was, um, there was quite a renovation <laughs> that took place. And so the, that's the same idea with this new heaven, new earth. Sorry for the backtrack, but when stuff pops in the head, i got to let it go. <laughs> i got to get it out. But, but the idea now is that God, again, why can God dwell? Why is the dwelling place of God with man? How, why can this be? We have the sin's been dealt with. Yeah, there it is. God can't be in the presence of sin. And so the earth is, is made new, the earth is, is, is renovated, there's, there's a freshness to it, there's a purity to it, all of this stuff. The new Jerusalem, like that bride coming in purity, coming down to the husband, now God is dwelling with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. What a, what a, what a beautiful picture of, of all of that. And I'm not getting into this, but it, but it, but it kind of talks about it. If you, if you ever want to go back and study like the, the Abrahamic covenant, the Davidic covenant, um, and even the new covenant in these aspects, you know, one of the big things, especially in the new covenant, is what? We are reconnected with the Father. There is no longer that separation. The new covenant in the blood of Jesus brings us 
or restores us to the Father. So we're seeing in this scripture of God dwelling with man and, and he will he God himself will be their God. We're seeing that fulfillment of all of those covenants finally coming to pass. And you know, what an amazing thing. You know, God himself. We understand that, that with Christ we have God himself, but but I think you understand now heaven and earth are reconnected. And I've talked about this in the past. I'll, I'll bring it up again. Where is heaven? Do you think it's at a literal place? I think it is. I, and, I, and I said this. I had a seminary professor, and, and take this with a grain of salt, um, super, super smart guy. Um, but, but he was convinced that there was a place in the universe that you could actually see that he believed that's where heaven was, was located. Take it with a grain of salt. And, and his reasoning behind that was... Um, Basically, there was, there was no collection of stars in this area. And, and his thought was, is, is heaven is drawing all the light in. So, again, take it with a grain of salt. That's a black hole. <laughs> <laughs> take it for however you want it. But I think the point is, it is at a literal He's place. <laughs> <laughs> heaven is not just sort of this... I don't know. How would you describe it? I don't think heaven has a, an address. You say that. <laughs> but it is a literal yeah. place. In, in the sense of, it's not some sort of nebulous, kind of cloudy, sort of, you know, dreamy place. It's real. It's very, very real. And what we're having now, and, but we're not there. There's not this connection. And even with the heavens, you know, you have three heavens. You've got the sky, the, what we see within the atmosphere, and then you've got the stars, and then you've got the third heaven. You've got the real heaven. Are any of those connected here on earth? You remember the expanse when, during the creation. He was separating the heavens from the earth. Now we're seeing heaven and earth connected. connected. They're, they're joined here. I mean, that excites me. That's, a, that's, a, that's an awesome thing to think. There's What God is doing... He did it through the cross. He did it through the, through, through the renovation of, of the new heaven and the new earth. The effects of sin and everything that would cause us to be distant from God, gone. Gone. Maybe that's why the sea's gone. No more fishing. There's no more... <laughs> how many people have you known? I, I've, I've met people. Oh, yeah, I worship... You know, I fish on Sundays, and that's how I worship God. I think, Roy, have you shared that before? Because, I mean, that's kind of... I, I feel like people, so they can worship God out on their golf course, but do they? Yeah, that's that's yeah. Well, do they? they? <laughs> Probably not. I mean, I've played golf. <laughs> I haven't played it much as a Christian. There's probably a reason why, because you know, if, if you want to think you've progressed in your Christian life, go play golf. <laughs> I mean, it's 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 a it's a humbling it's a humbling sport, no well, doubt. Goldfish. Yeah. That's probably why I don't fish much anymore either. I fished once this year. I'm just not good at it. Anyway, fishing doesn't nearly as upset me as much as golf. Don, do you get upset on the golf course? I didn't think so. Don is just this. Just smooth. You ever play with anybody who gets upset? His clubs can fly. Let me tell you a funny story. I, I grew up in a golfing family. That's that's what my family did. We at one point for, for years, lived across um, the 18th hole of golf course. My brother was a golf scholar in, in college, and you know, that, was, that was it. You know, it was, that's what we did. We were golfers. And, but I remember as a kid, the first time my dad took me out on the course, me and my brother, we never played, and we weren't allowed to play. We were kind of his caddies. You know? <laughs> and, uh, and, and he was just kind of explaining the rules of the game to us and all this stuff, and he said, look, don't ever get mad and slam your club. And we're like, okay, you know, we're learning the rules. And Dad's just playing. He's got a putt about yay far. And, and he missed it. And I'll never forget it. I don't know, I don't remember per se what he said, but I wouldn't repeat it if I did. But he buried the head of that putter this deep in the green. And my brother and I were looking at each other like, Wait a minute! You're not supposed to. You're not supposed to, you know, throw your clubs or anything like that. And you know, golf. Golf can do that to you. Golf can. Golf can bring the worst out in you. Yes, sir. He usually probably makes that. Uh, 
Right? Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I never. <laughs> <laughs> That's, is that when I for years and maybe it was I don't know for years I because I when I was a teenager I got frustrated with golf and I started throwing my clubs I quit I was done. Now as an adult I started playing, again, and my desire was I just want to be mediocre. That's all I want to be. And the last time I played golf, I was mediocre. And I was quite satisfied. And that was seven years ago. I haven't played in seven years. You have years. to play golf just to enjoy the scenery. If you can do that, then you'll have it. <laughs> you play, nice. George, you, you play, you, don't you? You can do yeah. that yeah. on somebody golfing. Yeah. Oh, I, there's some pretty golf courses there. <laughs> oh. like, um, but you're right. Yeah, you can enjoy the thing. scenery following somebody. This first line at the Wirtis Golf Course at 730 to 830 in the evening when there's nobody there. Oh, you and the deer. Yeah. That's how it was. We played, um, you know, north of Pittsburgh. That's my dad's company had a, had a country club, so we were able to play up there anytime we wanted. And and I know that that scenery when you're up there, you know, the sun's yeah. you're getting in your last holes, like it. and, and it's setting and it's peaceful. Nobody else yeah. is out there. That is, it is beautiful. I think golf courses are some of those beautiful things to just quiet and be out there. How do we get on this? I don't remember. <laughs> anyway. We were talking about God wiping away all. Things. No, that's where we're headed. Yeah, that's maybe that's it. I was I was being preemptive because. <laughs> that's that's fantastic. He will wipe away every tear, golfer or not. If you're a Christian, he's going to wipe away every tear from their eyes. Why are we crying? Sadness. But what's making us sad? Because a lot of us stayed behind. What, anybody else? And I, I don't have an answer. I mean, there's not, you, you can't have an answer. Just be the presence of God. I mean, you're just overwhelmed by, I mean, that you make this physical connection because he's down with the people. He's well, and it, it could be just seeing other people, too, that, yes, true too. that we know were there. I mean, that's, you know. Finally realizing that you made it. <laughs> <laughs> Read the next line. That's, the next line. that's where you're. It says, he will, uh, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. That you would feel sorrow for the people that are left behind. I don't think that's even going to be an emotion at that stage. Because I mean, you're just pure. Yeah, we're going to be consumed yeah. with Christ. God, New Jerusalem is... Yeah, I don't think we'll, we'll see... Because, okay, you think about it. But why would, he, what is your, why would he wipe yeah. the, what, the tears of happiness? Well, that's what I mean. What would you... Uh, well, how, would it, when you you're, if you're, let me ask you this. If your father howls crying because he got straight A's, you would wipe the tear away. Yeah. That's what I was just about to say, George. I agree. Our so show, our, we have a good example in our show. There have been many happy tears and hugs, of you know, in our families and before, you know. And, and again, exactly, you know, it's a, it's a time to rejoice and, right. you know, so. Could it be, could it be, you know, I'll just throw this out there. You know, we see this. We see the new Jerusalem. We hear God saying, I'm dwelling with my people. I will be there. I'm not worthy of that. I'm not worthy of that. Even though I've gone through all this, even though I'm in a glorified state now, I'm still not worthy. We know they cast their crowns and fall on their faces. No, not confused. No, just just in the sense, I wouldn't say confused, but just in the sense of, yeah, yeah, just uh, uh, emotionally. This is, I don't deserve, you know, not standing there like, yes, I'm finally getting what I deserve. You know, this is, I've been waiting on this for a long time. The apostles around the throne of Christ casting their, casting themselves before. Ca- yeah, and they, casting you know, those crowns, saying, realizing you know, I'm not are worthy. Not, yeah. yeah, I'm not yeah. worthy. And again, I'm worthy just, is the lamb. Just, yeah, exactly. You know, Roy, do you have anything in your Bible that, that no, gives I, us? I had a note in here that I'd written sometime it said Psalm 56, 7, but it doesn't apply to anything. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of like my Isaiah 65, 17. <laughs> you yeah, the my connection. Isaiah 65, 17 was way down at the bottom, much farther than I should have written it, but I'll just make a little note. There we go. But regardless of, of what, what generates these tears, let's, let's think about this, though. In a sorrowful way, why do we cry? Like, what's the underlying... Remorse. It could be separation. Okay. Mm-hmm. 
Ultimately, I think when we cry today, be it because of pain, be it because of separation, what, what's, what's the ultimate cause of that? Like when you boil it down and whatever's left in the pot is the purity of it. Cleansing. Sin. You know, Cleansing when we cry, if you get hurt and you cry and you feel that pain, what's, what's that from? I mean, was, was in the sense of pain or even in the sense of pain of loss separation what caused that I'm not saying you sinned but I'm saying sin causes separation there was no separation before sin we I'll give you an, an example we we went on the roller coaster at Ocean City and they strapped me in with my hips the way they are I had to put my knees way up oh. like this and it hurt so bad they clipped me in like this and every time that roller coaster went from one side to the other I was crying <laughs> And it was because my body is deteriorating. I was crying. And that's the, and that's the that's point. That's the sin that yeah. we're talking about, that, that, you know, that deterioration, that decay, you know. Because you look, and, and as Don said, read the, the rest of the verse. Death. What's, what's the underlying thing of death? Shall be no more. Yeah. Sin. So it's not going to be any more. Right. Mourning. You know. Joy. All this stuff. Pain. You know, all this stuff. So wrong. Yeah. All of these things. Um, but again, I don't know, regardless of what generates those tears. And grief, you know, it yeah. says grief, of course. And, you know, when we do things that are wrong, we grieve sometimes. Yeah. Whatever it is, he's wiping them away. You guys familiar with, um, um, oh man, what's his name? Why am I not thinking of it? Guitar player? Bob. Um. No, Fred. no. Jimi Hendrix. No, um, um, Cream. He was in Cream. What am I'm missing? It. Why am I not thinking? Of it? Oh, Eric Clapton. Eric Clapton. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Eric Clapton, interestingly enough, claims to be a Christian. If you know anything about Eric Clapton and slow, do you know anything about him? You don't know anything about Eric Clapton? One of the best guitarists, I guess, that, that ever has been, and you know, all and this he, stuff. And he led. And he led yeah. George Harrison woman away. Yeah, yeah, yeah and that's, married her. Yeah, that's a weird thing. <laughs> but years ago, but he, but he does claim to be a Christian, which is kind of interesting. And, and you know, he's gone through se- severe addictions and things like that. But years ago, and I can't remember when this happened. Um, I think it was in New York. He had a, th- a three-year-old son, and his son was playing up against a window and fell out of the high-rise building and died. And and he wrote a song about that. And it's called No More Tears in Heaven. It's a beautiful song, and yes. it's written about basically, would you know my name if I saw you in heaven? Would, would you, you know, all this stuff. And then he goes through this song, and he says, because I know I don't belong here. Uh, you know, if I see you in heaven, I know I, he's saying he doesn't belong there, feeling, I guess, the innocence of his son being three years old. He, he does, but, but the premise of that song is there's no more tears in heaven. And, and that's the reality. Whatever generates these tears... Whether it's happiness, whether it's sorrow, whether it's remorse, God's wiping them away. Hey, we're not going to be crying. What are we going to be doing in heaven when we see God? Worship. Yeah, worshiping. We're not going to be crying. You know, we're going to be in His presence. And again, I'm more than. I mean, I'm so looking forward to the worship in heaven. And I've described this before. There have been times, and we've I think experienced it in our church, where you you know, in an, in a in such a tangible way, the spirit is there, the worship is there, it is so real. Um, you don't want to leave it, but we do leave it. Regardless of what it is, you know, the worship service ends or we're distracted, we all of these things. Life. Yeah, you know, and, and not here. There's no distraction that's going to lead us away. There's no sea, you're not going fishing. There's no, there's no, cell, phones. <laughs> right. there's no cell phones. Will we eat in heaven? Probably. Jesus ate. But will you be hungry? No. Yeah. So, as you're sitting there worshiping, you know, and, and anybody hear stomach growl while, while you're worshiping? Let me tell you, the, the sermon last Sunday was pretty long, which was kind of funny because if you see me, this is, this is interesting. Sarah had a dream. Maybe she's a prophetess. She had a dream that, about me preaching. And the dream was that I was preaching so long 
And I guess it was on a continual basis that I, I would take an apple with me and put it in the pulpit. And when I finished eating that apple, it was time to end the sermon. So, so if you see me put an apple, or if she comes up and places an apple on the pulpit, now you, you understand. She, she jokes when her dad would preach, you know, Sarah... Um, you know, if you haven't guessed it, you know, she's, she was a strong-willed child, you know, but a very, very funny woman. Um, but she would stare at her dad and go, when he was in the pulpit, he didn't think that was very funny. I probably wouldn't either. But anyway, so if there's an apple in the pulpit, you understand. But the point I'm trying to make is that, that there will not be that ending of worship. There, there's not going to be anything that... And I'm not saying that, that when somebody gets hungry or, or we have to go on with our life, that's sinful. But again, that's, that's here on earth. That's, that's our life. That's not what's going to be taking place. As we're in worship, it's going to be a continual thing because there's constant communion with God. I mean, really, worship is when we commune with God. We have that constant, you know, he's, he's present. We acknowledge that. It's, it's, there's this reciprocated aspect of it, and that's going to be heaven. He will be with us. He will be our God. Nothing's going to pull us away from that. Again, the former things have passed away. I mean, not, not, like, we, not like we have known, nor like we expect. It's going to be so much more than that. But then he says, It's about to get better. Yeah. And he who is seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new a powerful statement but it for us as humans it has to begin with christ in christ we are a new creation the old is gone the new has come um that's that's such a powerful thing when you think about it a new creature new creation all of these things what is what is he changing in us when we come to faith in christ when when we trust in him what, what's he change? Yeah. He takes out that heart of stone and replaces that with a heart of flesh. And in, in, in that sense of the word flesh, it doesn't mean fleshly like, like in a negative way. But, but what it does, what is a heart of stone? Does it beat? Does it live? No, no. There's no life in a heart of stone. But he takes that out and he gives us a heart of flesh that lives and longs and beats for him. And that's, that's a beautiful picture of, of what he does for us on the inside. It, it happens on the inside first, and then outwardly are the manifestations of that. Outwardly is the byproduct of salvation. You don't see it first. You, know, you don't clean yourself up and then, okay, I've worthied myself now. Jesus, come on in. I've cleaned up, and you're now my heart is open to you. It doesn't work like that. I think we all know that in coming to faith in Christ. He, he comes in. He cleans house. <laughs> he makes you a new creation. And then he changes your thoughts, your attitudes, the direction of your life. I mean, he changes the direction of my life. I think in, in, as, as we let him lead, he leads. And, and that's, so we find he makes all things new. This is a continuation, but again, he is making all things new. That kind of echoes what we saw in the first verse here. Also, he said, write this down. For these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. Now, where does that take you? Yeah, to the cross. Jesus saying those same words, it is finished. That's in the sense of, of salvation and redemption. There's nothing more we could do. There's nothing we can take away from what Jesus accomplished on the cross. We simply reach out to it in faith and believe it. Now, he's talking, it is done. The judgment's finished. The new heavens and the new earth. Jerusalem is coming down. We're there. You know, we, we've arrived. We've we've. All of the prophecies and all of the longing for all of this to happen is finally here. It is done. And then he says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. What's he mean by that? Because that's a phrase that's often used in, in many different contexts in secular ways. What is He's eternal peace. But what is Alpha and Omega? Yeah. Well, first it's the beginning and the end of the Greek. Alphabet. Yes. Yes. And that's what he's meaning, and that's that's the sense of he is the beginning because where was he before time began? He was. Yeah. <laughs> he's eternal, and therefore he is the end. He's brought it all to an end. He's he's made all things new. So time does time exist here? It's, it's finished. Now, he transcends time, but in the sense of time, he is the beginning of time, and he's also the end of time. And therefore, now, he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. That's it. 
we've, we've, we've entered into eternity. What's that going to be like? I, our minds can't fully comprehend what eternity in that sense is going to be like. Because there's no time. There, it, it just, we can't. Everything we do is so based off of time. What time is it? It's almost 8 o'clock. Yeah, we, yeah, you know, I mean, seriously, what time do we start church? 10 o'clock? And we've worked hard to try to start now on time. Um, you know, I, I try to be very aware when 11.15 rolls around, it, you know, to try to be out of church. I understand um, those kind of things. Um, you know, time. It, it, when you think about the command that time has upon us, um, Anybody here set an alarm? I know you you set an alarm. Anybody else? Roy, you have an alarm? You just wake up? Hmm? Right here. <laughs> we have alarms. I, I have alarms. I have a different one set for Sunday than I do every other day of the week. But it's time. We're in time. And, and, and if you just step back and think about it, how much time really is involving everything that we do, eternity's not going to have that. So See, here's my thought. 24 hours a day, you have the sun, then you have the moon, you have darkness, you have light. Right. In heaven, I don't think you're going to have just what we're experiencing today because of 24 hours. Right? And we'll get dark, into what's, we'll jump ahead, what's providing the light of the new God Jerusalem? Christ. Yeah, it's yeah, Jesus. So, so even the day cycle is gone because it can't exist in eternity. So it's not going to be like anything we, we think or imagine. We, we truly we can't. can't. We can't. Now, it's written in a human or a language in which we can kind of build an idea of thoughts about it, but we really have no clue until we truly experience it. I'm, for, I'm looking forward to it. I mean, that's just going to be amazing. And then he says, To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. I thought about this, and, and I, I thought about it because you said, Where's this water coming from? Spring in Davis. Anybody drink from the spring in Davis? No, this one is close mountain. Oh, okay. <laughs> Even better. <laughs> you know, three years every morning, well, five days a week, I drank from, from that spring. Never once did somebody tap me on the shoulder and say, hey, that's a buck. You, you got to pay for that. You know, it's, it's beautiful water. It's pure water. It's, it's wonderful. It's cool. All of the things that, that water should be. Now look at what God's saying. To the thirsty... I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. You know, to the the thirsty, this idea, water of life, what is that? What's he talking about? Yeah, it's it's kind of almost poetic language, but we're talking about eternal life. There's no end to eternal life. He's not talking about actual H2O. No, no, no. I don't. I don't think so. I don't think in that. I think here it's it's, it's much more symbolic. Yeah, the much much more the idea of because number one, is there going to be thirst in heaven? No, no, there's not. All that you know, the, the sense of our physical thirst, we we're parched. That's not going to be heaven. But spiritually speaking, there's no more longing. There's nothing else that needs to be fulfilled. Right now, we've not arrived at this. There is a sense in us that if that if we died at this moment like they did in Hebrews chapter 11. The promises are not yet fully fulfilled. They died in their faith. We would die in our faith. Now we understand we're on the other side of the cross, but here there's no more faith. It's not needed. Everything is fulfilled. Everything. There's no more spiritual longing for anything that we don't have. There's no more prophecy. You know, it's not like, oh man, I can't wait till this prophecy is fulfilled. It's finished. He said it's done. Everything is complete. It's all there. And without payment, again, the idea and what I get from this, eternal life, you're not, you're, not, you're not paying for it. You're not earning it. It's not a wage. It's a gift. Now, we do earn something, which is death. It's the wage of our sin, but all that's done away with. We're finished with all of that. So the one who conquers will have this heritage. I will be his God, and he will be my son. The one who conquers. Who is the one who conquers? Does that mean the one who, who makes it through life without ever messing up? What's that mean? What do you think that means? I guess the one who uh, is born again. Yeah, that's it. How do we conquer? How do we conquer sin? We don't do it in our own efforts. We don't do it in our own abilities. We don't do it in, in just uh, trying to abstain from sin. We don't become monks and go... You know, I was watching a show... Um, 
can't remember where it was, but these, these monks went on top of this high mountain, and you can still get there today, but you have to climb a rope to get to it and all of these things to get up there. And, and you know, they wanted to, to separate themselves. I, I can guarantee if, if you go off by yourself, Thinking, okay, if I just get alone and live the rest of my life, I'll be there'll be no sin. It's not going to happen. You will sin. Your thoughts. <laughs> You'll sin. Your thoughts. But the idea of conquering here is trusting in the one who overcame on our behalf. It's Christ. He is the one. And he says, I will be his God and he will be my son. We're children of God. We're true children of God. Not just created by God, but true children of God. But then we come into verse 8. Verse 8 is pretty negative. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexual immoral, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Now, we understand that's an eternal judgment. However, how do you get from being sexually immoral or or a sorcerer or idolater to being a conqueror? You don't just climb up the ladder. You don't just try to get your good stuff to outweigh your bad stuff. How do you get there? Trust in Christ. So even as this is being read right now, somebody who reads this, can't. they don't have to sit there and go, oh, there's no hope for me. I'm so immoral. I've got no hope of of conquering. There is hope. As long as there's, there's breath in our lungs, as long as we are reading this, there is hope for anybody to turn to faith in Christ and get out of that second death. I mean, that's where, and I talked about it, you know, preaching about hell it's it's not my reality. It's not my destiny. But yet, and I shared how the heat of it. I want to, I want to feel the heat of it when I preach about it because it is a reality in the sense of not to keep me warm, but but the reality of you may be preaching to people right. who need to be plucked out of that. You, you may be preaching to people who need to hear God and the truth of God and have an encounter with God to be plucked out of the condemnation that they're under because they are, according to Scripture, under condemnation because they are in a state of unbelief. Um, So again, even though it's pretty negative in the sense of who's not going to be there, because here's a comparison. You have conquerors versus what? Let's balance the scales a little bit. They don't balance. (laughs) You You got cowardly, faithless, detestable, murderers, sexual immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, Liars. That's just eight. Eight versus one. I think there's a great analogy to be taken there in the sense of, again, narrow is the gate. And narrow is the path as opposed to the broad way, which is the way the world is, is, is going. Um, but again, it, it all goes back to Christ. It all goes back to Jesus. It's yeah. what he's done for us on the cross. That's it. That's what makes us overcomers. That's what makes us more than conquerors, as, as Paul described it in Romans. What do you guys, anything you want to add at the end? Questions, comments? Job. Anybody else? Got anything? <laughs> Nothing? No, I'm just, it's amazing. Like I say, it's amazing what is in store for us. So, you know, that's, like I say, it. we're going to home, we're going to home and reflect on it. Cool. And that's what, I, that, you know, that's what I want us all to do. And I, you know, again, I want this in the book of Revelation to spur us on in our worship. I think that's a huge thing, to, to do this, to recognize what God has done, what he's going to do, what we look forward to, to spur us on to a, a, a depth of worship that we haven't, that we're not at, you know, to... And I heard it, I heard it said recently, and, and it, I'm kind of adopting it as my own. Someone was talking about, and it was the preacher, the closer he gets to, to meeting Jesus face-to-face... And, and when, when I think, think about this, and this may make, make it into the Sermon Sunday too, every single one of us, every second, is one breath closer to seeing Jesus face to face. When we consider that our reality, how do we want to be living? What do we want to be longing for? Where, we, where do we want to put our, our, our treasure? Where do we want to store it up? You know, we're, we're getting closer to that time. And, and if, we're, if we're alive or, or dead in Christ, we're going to meet him in the air. We understand that. Um, but we are getting closer and closer to that time. And, and I think that that should spur us on to, to long to see him more. The closer we get, you know, you think about it. You just saw family members. How did you feel? Some that you haven't seen in a while. But the closer you got to Ocean City, 
Oh, Probably with the kids. Yeah. There's that intensity that builds yeah. up, you know? Well, it's like, man, this is going to be... Well, it's funny because, uh, you know, they started posting pictures a few days before I got there, and that just kind of, the anticipation you know, of seeing, you know, my family was really cool. You know, you're right. I was really excited about it. And I think that's 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 how we should be when, when we realize how close or how much closer we are every day, every moment, every breath yeah. to seeing our Lord and Savior face-to-face. Pretty exciting. Pretty exciting.